Okay, so I, I want to talk about privilege and I want to talk about the way that it's used on social media and the way that people are applying it and some of the problems that I have with that. There is a specific clip that I watched uh, that, is, that has motivated me to make this video. Uh, but before I do that, what I first want to do is to just tell you about one of the one of the general problems that I have with privilege before I go on to this specific issue that I've seen for about 10 years now since people started talking about it. And I'll play you the clip uh, that had motivated it before I do that. But first, let me say that I have no concept, no problem with the general concept of privilege. As as I heard somebody say a few years ago, and th this was somebody online that I really dislike, and yet when I heard them say it, I thought, actually, that's a pretty good point. What they said is, if you've ever started talking about people being underprivileged, then you can't then ignore the fact that there's such a thing as privilege, because if some people are underprivileged, then some people must, by definition, be more privileged. And I think that the concept is a, a valid concept. I just think it's very, very badly misused. I, and and one of the ways, the way that I'm going to talk about the majority of this video, is that it, it, it's often done in a way that ignores the granularity that we have within our societies. I'll try and explain that in a minute. But first, let me say the other problem that I have with it is that I think that what we end up doing is conflating two rather different things under this general heading. If you look at the things that are classed under privilege, and there's a useful list on the Wikipedia page for it, so I'll just read that out. It says education, social class, caste, age, height, weight, nationality, geographic location, disability, ethnic or racial category, gender, gender identity, neurology, sexual orientation, physical attractiveness, religion and other differentiating factors when you think about these things they actually they actually all constitute a kind of spectrum from things which are thoroughly social factors and i'll, I'll, I'll explain what i mean by that to some things which are physiological uh, metrics which are really hard to get away from. So let me explain what I mean. So at one end of the scale, it talks about disability. And we've all heard about this, this idea of sort of able-bodied privilege. That effectively, for example, having a set of legs that work or not being a quadriplegic that just has to lie on a bed all day is a privilege. That it puts you in a privileged position. And of course it does. But that is manifestly different in how we would feel about that, surely, from the privilege that would be associated with race or something like that or sex, where generally what we're referring to are societal norms and expectations and values that are privileging one group above another in an unwarranted fashion. Surely that's very different from the simple fact that having a set of legs that work is actually a pretty useful thing to have in most aspects of one's life. And it means that you can do things that you can't do. I can go fell running. I can't if I haven't got any legs, right? I mean... These are different things at, at root, and how we feel about one of them and how we tackle one of them is different to the other, I think. And yet they're all sort of mushed together. And you might say, well, if they all sat nicely at each end of the spectrum, then it wouldn't be quite so bad. But it's not as simple as that, because when we look at some of those things, like sex and gender, um, or when we look at things such as uh, height, or age, there may be situations where, yes, there's a privilege associated with it, but it makes sense, and other situations where the privilege associated with it doesn't make sense, and it might be something we'd wish to push back against. But that's all kind of lost in the mix, I would say. So that's a bit of a problem, but let me play you the clip. This was a clip from a conversation between Lawrence Fox uh, who I actually think is a bit of a dickhead, to be honest. But it was a clip that was on Twitter. But it's not Lawrence Fox I'm here to discuss. It's the woman that he was uh, interviewing. And this is just a classic claim that is made here. And this is everything that I think is wrong about the way that we talk about privilege. 
And I do know that systemically, globally. Now, yes, yes, okay. correct. And 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 when we when we talk about it, we always say that a person who is uh, white technically cannot experience racism. How come? Simply because they are born with a privilege, which is the colour of their skin. So, so I'll come to what she says in a minute. But one of the things that that I always feel, the vibe I always get off this is that when people make this kind of argument, that what they're actually creating for themselves is a privilege. It's a privilege where their behavior is then excused. In this situation, she can say anything towards Lawrence Fox. She can say the most racist thing about his skin uh, or about his ethnicity as she wishes. And it doesn't really matter because she can't be racist against him because in this way, apparently he's got more privilege than she's got. That they're effectively affording themselves a privilege. And that's the point, really, is that you can have a situation where somebody overall is more privileged than somebody else. But it, it, it ignores the granularity. And the granularity is, is that whereas overall they may have more privilege, that doesn't mean they have more privilege in every circumstance. Just let me say first she talks about racism is prejudice plus power. Technically. The problem is technically she's wrong. She's talking out of her arse. What she's trying to say is, is that within the social sciences, within one field of the social sciences, that of critical race theory, because it suits the kind of arguments that they make, because it suits the kind of thing that critical race theorists are interested in, which is the intersection of prejudice and bigotry and power, that's the definition that they use. But that doesn't make it technically the definition. It isn't even technically the social sciences definition. I made a video discussing some of this about four years ago now, and I actually showed you the social science dictionaries, and it, this isn't the definition that's within them. That's just within the social sciences. Never mind when you start looking at governmental and non-governmental bodies that have the definitions of racism, and they don't use this kind of definition. It's just hogwash, that point that she's making there. But the main problem is this idea of granularity. It makes no sense. Effectively, what she's saying is that for each group, whether we're talking about races, uh, gender identities, the two sexes, whether we're talking about people of different heights, age groups, whatever, so what you do is you take each group and then what you do over all the different social circumstances. So it's not just things like the field of employment, but you've got to look at different fields within employment. You effectively evaluate their, their level of privilege in some privilege stack within that. OK, so it's like you've got a little measure of each one and you tip each one of them into a beaker for that for that group until you've got a level in that beaker. And then you hold the beakers together for all the different groups and you see whose beaker is the tallest. And that's the one that's the privileged one. And you don't worry about all the different spheres, right? It could be that although they've got the tallest beaker when it's all tipped in, that when you look at the different spheres, that it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a much more granular <laughs> approach to that, you know. It's equivalent to saying men are taller than women, which they are when you average it out. But then seeing a woman who's six foot two and a guy who's five foot seven and saying to the six foot two woman, no, no, you can't be taller than the guy because men are taller than women on average. So women can never be taller than a man. That just makes sense. It's an absolute nonsense. It's an absolute gibberish. But this is the claim that gets smuggled in when we talk about privilege. There's some kind of subjective, because there is, of course, no objective way of calculating it. There is this sort of subjective measure of privilege that gets assigned to a group. And sometimes we can agree. The differences are large enough that we can generally agree, OK, so this group is more privileged than this. But then effectively what we say is, well, it doesn't matter about the individual circumstances. It doesn't matter about in certain spheres, it may run in the other direction. But of course it does. Maybe some of the largest ones you would see would be on the issue of sex, where the general societal consensus is that in Western 
certain countries men have more privilege than women um and yet there are some clear and manifest examples that run in the opposite direction entire sectors such as the area of education where girls and women outperform boys and men all the way through the system that's a privilege okay that's a privilege and overperformance is a privilege the area of parenting where I, I've no doubt it's due to perfectly understandable uh, physiological factors. Women get pregnant, women have babies, women nurture those babies, especially in the first few months. But it leads to this situation where we prioritise motherhood over fatherhood. There is a, a certain privilege to being a mother. Fathers are kind of second-class parents, let's be honest, in almost every single sphere. That's how we look at it. And even mothers and fathers themselves when countries put out these these sort of uh, policies for for shared parental leave the uptake amongst fathers is something like one percent 99 percent of that shared leave is taken by the mother and that seems to go all the way down the systems till you get sometimes to divorce and family courts where they prioritize motherhood over fatherhood the presumption is is that the child especially if it's a younger child will be better off with the mother before anything's even been looked at that that is the a priori assumption that is made. Now, obviously, there are other areas of, of society which go against this. But this is the point to suggest that, therefore, a father could never experience sexism. Because, well, when you take things that are nothing to do with fatherhood, but are to do with males and females, the average privilege for a man is greater than the average privilege for a woman. That just makes no sense, doesn't it? There is there is literally no sense in that argument whatsoever. And what do you even gain? from that kind of argument because it doesn't impress anyone I don't think it doesn't allow you to make a point when you say that a white person um, you cannot be racist to a white person she can sit there and say what she likes to Lawrence Fox right she could say some of the most disgusting bigoted prejudiced thing against white people that you could imagine but none of it's racist right can't be racist what, what, who who does that impress what what does that serve what's the benefit of that i think it's zero all it does is it is it is it pushes people away from some of the more sensible ideas that she'd like to bring to the table why not just say yeah of course anybody can experience racism but typically the racism experienced by these groups more than these groups you know and of course the the racism that is experienced by groups and the prejudice that is experienced by groups and the privilege that is experienced by groups again with this use of race and ethnicity varies in in, in different spheres a, a wonderful example that i came across quite recently we know that in the united kingdom that uh, asian people east and south asian people uh do better uh, in terms of technology jobs, the technology sphere, than black people within the United Kingdom. So there's a privilege. They're getting more qualifications in those fields, and they're doing better, and they're getting a disproportionately high number of jobs in those fields versus a disproportionately low number of jobs in those fields. That's a privilege, right? Now, if you look at sport, there are just over twice as many British Asians as there are British black people. And yet in the field of sport, if you look at the England football team, which is the apex of the sporting pyramid in the UK, nothing's more important than association football. No team is bigger than the England men's team. There have been, over the decades, 103 black British representatives, guys that have played football for that team. Do you know how many British Asians there have been? I'll tell you, there's been one, one, there has been one in, in all those years. And that was a guy called Frank Chu in the 1930s. So the privilege map is so skewed in, in different directions, in different fields, that the idea that, well, this group is more privileged than this group, so, so this group is the only one that could experience racism, is, is just mind-blowing, isn't it? Couldn't it be possible that there could be some 
uh, racism in tech fields if you were evaluating a, a black applicant and an Asian applicant, whilst a football coach may have some privilege and racist views that would prioritise black footballers over Asian footballers, just based on what they're used to seeing and their stereotypical expectations of what these different groups are capable of attaining, you know, these kinds of unconscious biases that people have. Okay, yeah, that's the problem with it. It just removes all granularity, and by removing all granularity, you're reducing what is a useful concept to just effectively a stick. That is the only thing it becomes useful for, is a stick to beat people around the head with. And that is why people reject ideas of privilege, uh, checking your privilege, and all these privilege blindness and all these things. Because when you remove the granularity and use it with such little nuance, that, that it sort of gives the impression that you're not using it in a very honest manner. Okay, that's it. That's all I've got to say. It's a very, very interesting subject, I think. Interested to know your thoughts. Thanks for listening. Bye for now.